I'm going to go into a little bit more depth today about the Sabian symbols. And I, I tend to approach the, uh, the Sabians um, from the seven words perspective. It's very helpful for me to see seven different aspects of everything I, I'm studying ever. And um, the first word in the seven word system is no. And this equates to our identity. We are exactly who we are because we're not anything else. So the word no is used to establish identity. Applying this to the Sabian symbols and the uses of the Sabian symbols, we find that the determination, the self-determination, is made possible through knowledge of our principal Sabian symbols, which of course we would think of as the sun and the moon's position in the horoscope. The sun's position is to do with the essence of who we really are, our self-identity, who we know we are, who we want to be, what feels very distinctively us and not anyone else. The advantage of having um, a very particular model of this written as a Sabian symbol is immense. It is not okay for me to think of myself as Taurus. A twelfth of the world's population is Taurus. It's just not specific. It's, it's, it's different from the other eleven signs, yes, but um, I want it very specific indeed. And when you actually look at one three hundred and sixtieth of the, the circle, it becomes much more significant indeed. And the particularity of the Sabian images helps us to determine to the nth degree, in great detail, exactly who we are, potentially speaking. And it's unlikely, I have found, that we know this already. It takes some clue for us to awaken the awareness of who we really are. And when you actually just, if, if, if all you ever do is study the one Sabian symbol, just your sun sign and nothing else, and you study it, I don't mean read it once, casually. I mean, study it. Think about the exact words that have been used, the, the strangeness of the image, whether or not this image actually appears in your life. If it does, then look at what you've done when it appeared. Um, did you respond positively or negatively? Did you not deny it or accept it open-heartedly? How did you approach the, the first awakening of the actuality in your life of the Sabian metaphor. This gives you a real clue as to where you are in your process of awakening, self-awakening. If it was, shall we say, ah, a Eureka experience, yes, of course, I knew that really, I just never put it into words, then that's very good indeed. There's a huge difference, and it's not really given enough attention between knowing something intuitively so that you recognize it when it's said, oh yes, that's me, on the one hand. And on the other hand, being able to speak about it with consciousness, explain yourself using the seven, the, the images of the Sabian symbols. The difference between those two things is diminished in the importance of people. I'm underlining it very much. It is not enough to know that something applies to you intuitively as a feeling. Not really. What you have to be able to do is speak about it, using the Sabian symbol to do so, if you want really to know the Sabian symbol. And therefore, that part of you that the Sabian symbol represents. So, the, the primary aspect through which we can deepen our character and claim hidden aspects of our being is to become familiar enough with the Sabian symbol of one's sun sign to explain it to somebody else, to talk about it clearly, to identify how that particular image has made itself manifest in your history and what you're going to do with it in your future. So this is the sun sign. 
it's a lot more obscure in the moon's case. The moon represents unconsciousness, so we're not aware of it. That's what unconsciousness means. And we might be familiar with it. The moon is all about familiarity. We're, we're um, familiar with our family, and we're familiar with our hometown, and we're familiar with all of our habits. But are we conscious of them? Do we really know why our family is that unit and, and it's different from other families? In what particular way is it different? Do we really know what our habits are? What are we addicted to? What must we have? Do we really know why we love our hometown? What it is, um, is an emotional experience. Yeah, we all get that, but why? What is it about our hometown that we love? And the family and the habits and so on. Why do we do it? Now, the moon is the answer to this question. And it's, it's really not available to us, generally speaking. My moon's in Taurus, so what do I love? Well, I love eating, I love relaxing and um, just casually expecting and trusting that life will be fine. I'm a pretty laid-back kind of person sometimes. That's my moon in Taurus. Why? What, what's going on there? Why do I do that? What is it about me that does that? And there is an answer to that question. It's not just a rhetorical question. And the answer comes from the Sabian symbol. If one was to study the moon sign, one gets that sense of why we are unconscious in that area, why we can't really understand the feelings that we've got fully. And this is very helpful indeed. Whatever we can do to bring into consciousness that which was previously unconscious moves us one step closer towards realization. So in my case, I have the moon in the 27th degree of Taurus. This is the old Indian woman selling artifacts of her tribe. And she's pretty detached from whether or not she sells anything, whether or not the tribe likes her, whether or not it's raining or sunny. She just doesn't care. And the reason, I mean, I, I do feel like that. I, I don't really get upset about it very much. And that's always been the case. That was true when I was a child. Um, and the reason in, in this particular case is because she comes to be the representative of something ancient, something that's been passed down through the ages and is just moved through her into the future. It's inevitable that it will move forward. She's not able to fail. She can't become too important because there's a load of other people doing the same thing. She's just part of the collective agency through which wisdom is passed from past to future. And I didn't really understand that about myself, but there is something about me which is just like a a member of a relay race. My job is to understand what the previous people said and did and to understand it in my way and then to pass on my understanding to somebody else. Like a carrier. I don't have any special spin on things. Not really. I just want to pass on the fact that esoteric knowledge, um, the culture of the tribe, the way of doing things, the the feeling of being alive, just just let that stream pass through me. It's, it's a feeling rather than a, um, an understanding of, of the conscious mind, because it's the moon. And it's enabled me to know who I am, rather much more like my grandmother than I'd ever realized. I'd never associated myself with my grandmother until I started to understand this image. But, but now I realize that she is one of the most uh, important influences in my whole life. Her way of being, and it wasn't what she did or what she said, it was just her attitude was like, ah, what the hell, <laughs> life's life, what are you going to do about it? A second advanced application of the Sabian symbols is for us to train ourselves in the development of intuition. Typically people will just have intuition or not have intuition and, and there's no talk of developing it. 
But those of us who are serious about esoteric study and spiritual seeking, we can take a different approach. We can train ourselves to become more intuitive. Now, the, the key to this is really that intuition develops as we trust it. However, it must be said that there's a need for us to discriminate as well. Trusting your intuition isn't enough. You've also got to make sure you don't trust it when it's wrong. Intuition isn't always right. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. And it, it feels different. You, you can actually start to understand that the, the quiet voice inside that tells you something that cannot normally be known, that, that quiet voice of intuition. Well, there's, there's two voices. <laughs> And one of them spot on. It gives you information about the future and what to do about the future. Um, it's mysterious. And there's another one that gives you information about what's going to happen. And it doesn't happen. It's a lie. It, it, it's a false voice. And we have to learn to distinguish between those, those two things. Developing intuition requires us to look at feedback. We'll have a feeling. And if we're able to trust our intuition, we'll act upon that feeling. Now, sometimes when we act, it just doesn't lead to the results that we expect. Other times it does. What to do about that? Well, just notice. That's the first thing. Just notice whether or not your intuition is valid. And you might want to write it down just to clarify it. It's a bit like dreams, recording your dreams, write them down, and then later just see if they checked out, whether they came to pass or not. And this process of recording and measuring and identifying and examining, this, this is a more left brain approach, is the study of the right brain intuition. And this, this process of just checking out is important if we're to train ourselves in intuition. Um, intuition basically is an attitude of consciousness. It's, um, it's a way of, of operating the mind. One way of operating the mind is the focus. Just holding your attention clearly on a specific thing. That is an intuition, of course. Intuition is diffuse. It's just being open to subtle messages. And these subtle messages are always metaphorical and they're around and about in your environment. So you might see a goose, you might see a fox, you might see two people arguing, you might notice that the rain is creating an effect upon the, the, the river. And all of these natural phenomena um, have meaning. If and when we give them meaning. The idea, I, I, I don't go along with the idea that a, a particular dream means a particular thing. I know that very, very famous and important people have taught that that is the case, but I, I think I can see it a different way. I think every single experience we have throughout the whole of existence is ours. Some of them are shared but only the, the collective ones that matter to the collective. We all share the experience that gravity exists and the sun rises and rain falls and so on. And, and that's because it holds together our collective reality. But the interpretation of one's dreams has got no advantage um, in ha having the same meaning for two people. It just doesn't matter. If my dreams m mean something to me, that's enough. So, for example, in England we have red telephone boxes. And my guide once explained to me that if I dreamt of a telephone box, it has to do with communication. And you can see why that offer of um, interpretation is valid. But what if, in my experience, I, I, I didn't notice that there was a, a device for calling up somebody inside the telephone box? All I noticed was that it was red. It was bright red. And the redness really touched my feelings, and I wasn't interested in communicating with anybody. 
I was interested in becoming red, energetic and fiery, and, 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 and it meant redness to me. Then, as far as I'm concerned, red telephone boxes are to do with passion and fire, not communication and, and listening. It's, it's, it's different energies. So, the symbols that you see all around you, they're, the, they're metaphors that trigger your understanding. If a goose to you means eating something at Christmas time and, and feeling fat and happy and contented and a little bit drunk or soporific, if, if that's what it means to you, then that's what it means to you. And the goose is the symbol of relaxation and deserving to overeat because you've done the, the year's work. That's what it means to you. But if a goose to you means flying south for the summer, then you know, you're going to be wanting to get on the telephone to the travel agent and, and um, it's going to mean a different thing. So the intuition that we develop tells us which of these things it means to us personally, who we are, not anything written down about what it should mean. Not that these books on symbols are irrelevant, they're, they're certainly not. I think we, we have to train ourselves in understanding the symbols and having a compendium of classic symbols is very helpful in that. I'm just saying that that's not enough. That's the foundation. Beyond that point, we need to actually work it out for ourselves. And the Sabian symbols are all metaphors. And work it out for yourself what they mean. They meant something to Elsie something else to Jones, something else to Rudyard, they mean something else to me, and they mean something else to you. Work out what it means, and do this by trial and error. Just study one of the Sabian symbols one day, go out saying, well, I want to look at um, Aries 1, I want to see a woman rising out of the water and embracing a seal, and go and look for that. It's unlikely that you're going to see a naked woman arising out of the sea and embracing a seal in real life. But you might see a movie called The Mermaid, and, and you might think, well, that's close. Or, or you might have an activist group, protect the seals or something, and a woman who actually looks um, as though she's naked because she's dressed up in some costume on, on the street. That There would be something like that. Go out looking for it and, and insist to yourself, I'm going to find this. And you will. You'll find something. If, if you're good at this, you will. You've got to train. You know, it won't be day one, but in time, you will look, find what you look for. That's how all of this works. Now, we can develop the heart through the use of Sabian symbols. When we talk about the heart, we're not talking about a blood pumping machine. We're talking about the center of our energetic body, the heart center. It is a, a complex of energies and its sensitivity has its own particular vibration. So using the heart center, we can tune in to a specific vibration of reality around us. And when that is enacted as a behavior, it's called love very often. Mind you, love is, is not um, a very well-defined word. It is ever so ambiguous indeed. So I'm going to use the word compassion. Compassion comes from Latin, and, and it means suffering with. Passion is suffering. The passion of Christ was his suffering on the cross. Calm passion with suffering. Passion is suffering with somebody else. So when you see somebody who's having a bad time and you open your awareness of heart, you empathize with them. You, you, you vibrate on a heart level with that person. And they can feel it. It, they, they feel it as a radiant source of care and attention, and they feel loved. And because they feel loved, 
the pain is, is somehow reduced. A problem shared is a problem halved. The compassion energy is a healing force. It lifts somebody into a more resourceful state so they can deal with their issue and, and soften the burden. So compassion is a gift. And it's lovely when we give it, and it's lovely when we receive it. It's just lovely, and, and it's good to do it, because you like the feeling. If you look at the Sabian symbols of somebody else's horoscope, and you think about who they are, and, and what they're doing with that energy, um, that very function of thinking about someone else specifically thinking of them as though that Sabian image was what you had to work with and they're having a hard time with it maybe or, or you can see that they, they could break through and, and they're not quite understanding it but you want them to have an easier time and you want them to break through to be a, a fuller more magnificent version of themselves because it's it's person and you, and you love people and and it's life and you love life for no other reason. It's just the thing about compassion. It, it's there's no reason for it. You can't explain why you're compassionate. It's just beyond that. You're you're compassionate because it's what the heart does. The heart is compassionate and you have one, so you're compassionate. It is that simple. But if you don't experience compassion, if you don't express compassion, and if you're not open to receiving compassion, then the heart feeling is is not there. And if that happens for a long enough period of time, it, it's lost. The access to it is lost. People can dry up. I've seen this happen. The, the, the heart is a watery energy, and in a way it's its metaphor is is much like water, where there's this soft um, flowing and and um, interacting and and uh, um, moist uh, taste of of beingness associated with the heart, and and that's like water, you know. And so, if if you don't operate the heart, then you dry up. And you can't feel anything anymore, and you can't feel joy, and you can't feel beauty, and you can't feel loved, and you can't feel loving, and you don't care for anything, and, and it's just like, no, you, you don't want that. So, using the Sabian symbols to understand someone else awakens the possibility of deepening your compassion. Now the fourth application for the Sabian symbols associated with the word goodbye in the seven word system. Goodbye is not about leaving only, it can be about leaving, but it's also about getting closer to involvement. It's about a shift from the old to the new. The essential meaning of the word goodbye is what was is no more. The past has gone, I welcome the future. And the um, reason that we do not go through that process of healthy movement, freedom of, of growth, evolutionary ease, the reason for that always is emotional blocks. There's a difference in my mind between the word feeling and the word emotion. To, to feel things is just normal. We just have that facility of, of consciousness. We can think things, we can feel things, but emotionality and emotion is when we motion, we emotion, we, we move out of those feelings. It's not a requirement for us to take action on our feelings, but most people do. If they're angry, they get angry at someone. If they're sad, they, they suck in the attention of people. To, to suffer with them so that they pull on somebody else's capacity to heal them with their attention. So those two expressions of emotion are to do with the movement of feelings. And um, 
there's a way for us to move those feelings out of our system, out of our energetic system, without dumping it on someone else with our anger or our self-pity. And this is helped by our knowledge of sapiens. If we look at the, um, the approach to any sapien, you will see that the um, interpretation of it can take two different sides. There's a negative interpretation and there's a more positive interpretation. So this transformation that can occur within the sapien symbols interpretation can equally in, occur within our own self-awareness. So if you look at a Sabian symbol that, that um, relates to whatever emotion you're feeling, you know, you, you, we could talk about the moon, we could talk about um, any of them really, but let, let's talk about the moon for now because that's associated a lot with emotions. I mean, so is Mars, so is Venus. It's, it's not only the moon that's emotional, but we, we talk about one of them. When you find which of the Sabian symbols most clearly relates to the emotional process you're going through right now, just try and be self-honest and, and look at how badly you're interpreting it. Um, if, for example, the, um, the Sabian symbol, like my moon and then my sort of Indian woman, um, let, let's say I'm just being sluggish. Uh, my my air of detachment and, and carelessness is not experienced as a joyful um, ability to cope with all and everything that comes, which is its positive meaning. But I've interpreted it as um, sluggishness, and, and, and I'm not going to do anything, and I'm just going to be lazy, and, and I don't care, you know, that kind of energy. Very similar in interpretation, but the energy itself is... The opposite, really. Um, the idea of, of detachment and, and not really caring about anything is a high spiritual principle when it's approached with the right feeling, and a very low material principle when it's approached with the wrong feeling. So you can use the particular Sabian symbol that relates to your emotion and turn it around. Use that knowledge that you have to transform from negative to positive any of your feelings, any of your emotions. And um, we address the point here of, of, of the major growth mechanism in, in any spiritual journey, and that is the shift of perception. Growth is all about that. We change the way we see things. We see things that have been seen negatively. The glass is half empty. Oh to turn it around. The grass is half full. Oh. That shift from, oh, to, ah, oh, that emotional shift is all that you need to move from negativity to positivity in, in your life. As long as you do it consistently and frequently, in fact, all the time is best, just make sure you see the, the silver lining in any clouded situation. And we do this by changing our attention we give the attention to the positive interpretation of our Sabian symbol. And, and then it moves, moves us out of the doldrums and into the light. It is important for us to have a vision of where we're going. If we don't know where we're going, then we can't get there. And if we don't have a vision in our lives, then somebody else will have a vision of what they want us to do instead. And um, that's not appropriate for a, a spiritual seeker. We need to create our own sense of where we're going. If you don't have a vision, then the thing to do is to have a vision quest. In other words, to look for a vision. Knowledge of your sun sign and your moon sign in Sabian terms helps to understand who you are right now, here and now. And yet, the knowledge of something else in your horoscope will give you a better sort of grasp on where you're going. In one sense, the Midheaven speaks to us of this. The Midheaven is more associated, though, with our role within society. It's our title. I am a so-and-so. I'm an astrologer. 
Um, it's what society sees me as, perhaps. It's um, my worldly journey. And, and that can be my vision. Of course it can. But if I want a higher vision, a vision of where my soul gets to influence my journey, then I'd be looking for the North Node, probably. And if we look at these two Sabian images, the Midheaven on the one hand and then the North Node on the other hand, we're starting to get a sense of ourselves as greater, grander, more accomplished. And this is what we want. This is the vision that we're projecting into the future. If you think of your vision as, as like um, an anchor that you throw into the future, and then you pull yourself towards it, that's an image which works sometimes for me. I, I, I imagine myself at some point in the future, and the more specific, the better, the more powerful, um, surrounded by these people doing that thing in that location. I, I just see myself as I would love to be. And I might have a model for that. It might be one of my teachers or a beloved friend or a family member who, whom I admire or Admiration is a very useful quality for developing your vision. So, the vision quest is the attempt for us to become clear about that anchor. What is the, the thrust of our future imagination that we pull ourselves towards? We need that if we're to have a vision that works for us. And the Sabian symbol of our Midheaven or our North Node will help us find how to define that anchor. There's a better way if you are willing to study the Karma and the Dharma aspects in your horoscope. Now I've made a separate video of this and, and that the link to that will be shown at the end of this. So if you study the Karma and Dharma aspects in your chart you'll have a much clearer idea of your vision. The vision is your dharma. Your dharma is your, your spiritual quest, in one sense. And the karma is what's stopping you from understanding that. Now, in all spiritual traditions, the highest teaching is reflexive self-consciousness. Reflexive self consciousness. Being aware, conscious of yourself reflexively, in other words, through the eyes of another. How does the world see me? How does my family see me? How does my partner see me? How do my friends see me? If you add up all those bits and pieces of perception, not one of them is going to be accurate, not really, but Together, all of them really do tell a story of who you really are. And that's different from who you think you are. Because we have shadow, all of us. We deny what we don't like. We ignore what we can't imagine. We have not realized our true selves. And maybe some of our friends and associates can see that there's much more to us than we have realized yet. This ability that we have to see ourselves through an, the eyes of another is the greatest gift for anyone on the spiritual path. It, it, it enables us to be much more considerate because if, if we do something, what is the effect upon another person? That's implied within this reflexive self-consciousness. If you say something, if, if you have a, an attitude, a belief, an opinion, and, and you make it known that you are a staunch this, that, or the other, that will send out a ripple. That will influence some people. You, you might say something casual to a child, and, and they'll, they may take you seriously. And they, they may think it's okay to have racial prejudice, or, or gender prejudice, or whatever, because you've made a flippant remark. And being considerate to the 
effect that you have upon another is the, the key to open a spiritual dimension to your life. Now, the Sabian symbols will unlock that awareness on a much deeper level than, than anything else I've come across. And this is because to tune into the Sabian symbols, you need to awaken the facility that links the left brain and the right brain. The right brain thinking um, is intuitive. It's imagery, it's colorful, it's, it's musical, it, it, it's wafty, you can't define it. And when you meet somebody who's really strongly into their right brain in an imbalanced way, they will suggest things in an undetermined way and you've got to fill in the blanks yourself. <laughs> I come across this quite often with Pisces people, if they've got a moon in Pisces or sun in Pisces or something, and they would just hint at their perception, which they can't define because it's kind of indefinable. They're living in this Neptune reality that doesn't allow words. And they, 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 they just hint at the atmosphere of, of where they live and completely lost in the right brain. And I say, but what do you mean? And it's like, well, oh, don't bother me with the brain stuff. Whereas a right brain person, if somebody's lost in their right brain, they're, 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 they're require you to explain everything that you feel. Why does that music sound good to you? <laughs> I don't know. I don't care. I just love it. Why does that color mean more to you than the other color? They're the same. You know, I can't explain myself. You know, so the the right brain person is um, is is trying to explain what they feel, and the left brain person is is is, is, is it requires logical. Um, thinking, explanations, analysis of, of what cannot be analyzed. So somebody who's actually able to merge those together, I like to see it as, as the possibility that the left brain and the right brain communicate through the, the third eye, the pineal gland. And if you try and do both of these brainy things at the same time, that necessarily awakens the third eye. And the third eye, when awakened, is, is, perceives things differently. It, 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 it sees what normally is, is unseeable by most people. And when you've, when you've done this, when you've learned how to awaken your third eye and, and you're in a situation where you need to get someone else, you can get them. You, you just see something that tells you where they're coming from. So, if you introduce the Sabian methodology into this, the, the metaphors that Sabians use are all born from this, this zone. Elsie Wheeler was a trans medium and she just tuned in and, and she got the images and she spoke of the images and then there it is. It came from this position of the intuitive consciousness, and she found words to explain what she saw. She had to have both sides awakened, the left brain to explain what the right brain was able to see in, in her mediumistic imagination. So all of these Sabian images come from that place of the open third eye, I believe. Who knows what else he knew, but uh, it doesn't make any sense to me if that is not the case. We can use the Sabian symbols for divination. And in fact, Rudyard focused a lot on this. It was said that the 360 Sabian images were the Western equivalent to the hexagram in, in China, the, the Yijing, um, which is currently used for divination, even in the West nowadays. And the rune stones in the Nordic tradition had the same thing, and the tarot cards have the same kind of idea where we can use a particular set of images and open up the intuitive side of consciousness. That's what divination does for us when we consult the oracle. So the best way to consult the oracle is not to do it too often. If you do it every day, it's going to be normal, everyday and ordinary. That's, that's not what we're trying to do here. 
even if you do it every week. But if you do it rarely, when it matters, if you really want some advice, and this isn't something that you do every day, this is something that you do once in a blue moon, half a handful of times in a year, then the results that you get can be staggering, really staggering. Um, so you can make a spread for yourself if you want, or you can just choose a particular Sabian symbol to study, whatever you want to do with it. And you, you ask yourself a very clear question. Um, it's, it's, an, it's not okay just to press the button, get a Sabian image and read it, and, and that's your image for the day. That, that's, that's not divination. That's something else. I don't know what that is. But if, if you see the image and you have a question in mind and you believe, you have faith, that this is the answer to your question, then it will be so. And that's, it's nothing really to do with what comes to you. It's, it's, it's to do with your faith that what comes to you can be interpreted by the subtle aspect of consciousness that you have. We all have an area of consciousness which is not awakened normally. And the act of divination unfolds our ability to tune into that, the process of divination. So the process itself is the, the thing that makes it work. So for me, I, I would, as I say, very rarely I would do this. I would have a specific question which I've written down so I'm not confused about what I'm asking. I want to know what the answer means and therefore I want to know what the question was. So I write down a question. I will sit in meditation. I will light a candle. I will stay with the answer I get. I will read it. and I will read it again. And I will read it aloud, the key part. And I will stay with that and I will stay with this question until I get an answer. This is what makes it work and if you're not willing to do this process, if you're not willing to take it that seriously, my hearty suggestion to you is just don't do it at all. If, if you play with this stuff, it is lost to you. If you do not respect esoteric disciplines, then you have no access to esoteric wisdom. It, it, it's a part of the game that it has to include discipline, it has to include mystery, it has to be veiled in obscurity. That's what makes it work. And if you just approach it with a very ambitious, hurried, Western mind, I want to know the answer to this question. I will have it my way. I don't want to listen to all of these people telling me it's going to take time. For me, I can do it really quickly. <sighs> well, no. No. Now, I've summarized seven different uses of the Sabian symbols for the advanced practitioner, the Sabianologist. And, um, not all of these will appeal to you, and perhaps some of them will only appeal to you later. And that's fine, of course, you don't have to use everything that's possible. And there may be other uses. One of the uh, principal things that I've done with it is to develop the Elven Star method, by which I can tune into my soul consciousness much more easily. So I haven't listed all of the uses of the Sabian symbols, just the, the, the first seven obvious ones that came to mind. There's a lot of work to do on experimentation, I think, with all of this. And I love the idea that people are, are using them for um, to stimulate their artworks, most particularly Ruby Fumizki. But there are others who are actually drawing the, the Sabian symbols and, and getting into it differently. I think we have to remember that it wasn't Jones and it wasn't Rudyard that, that gave us Sabian symbols, not first. First of all, it was Elsie Wheeler, and it was nonverbal. And the idea that they mean this, that, or the other is an invention. They, they mean whatever it is they mean to you. Find them useful in your way. Mm -hmm.